Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Lisa Versace. I'm the Programs Engagement Manager here at the California Preservation Foundation. Uh, today's webinar is going to explore the work of landscape architects Florence Yoke and Ruth Shellhorn and their lasting influence on the landscapes of Southern California. Uh, we're exceptionally fortunate to be joined today by Kelly Comras, ASLA Fellow and author of Ruth Shellhorn, part of the Masters of Modern Landscape Architecture book series. As well as, excuse me, as well as Aaron Chase, Associate Curator of Architecture and Photography at the Huntington in San Marino, where Florence Yoke's papers are housed. Uh, today's program will be moderated by James Papp, author and architectural historian practicing in San Luis Obispo. Uh, if at any time during the program we have questions for our speakers or moderator, we encourage you to put them into the Q&A, which can be found at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, we'll do our best to address everyone's questions before the end of today's program. We sincerely appreciate your taking time out of your day to join us today. Our work is made possible by the generous support of members like you, our donors, and our sponsors. Uh, if you're not already a member, we invite you to join our preservation community by going to californiapreservation.org slash membership. And on our website, you can also find information on future programs and events. And with that, I will turn it over to James to get today's program underway. James? Okay. Um, Martha Goff complains that she has no sound, so I hope you hear me now. <laughs> you can take care of that. I'm just checking the chat box. Um, I really want to welcome everyone here today. Um, this is a, and this grandiose landscape behind me is, um, I'm broadcasting from the um, History Center of San Luis Obispo County. Uh, where I'm hanging an exhibition, but just to emphasize all of these wonderful institutions that support our work, including county historical societies. Um, this series, uh, focusing on women landscape architects and women architects beyond uh, which we gave the title to that I'm not entirely happy with beyond Morgan, but we're always focusing on, you know, Morgan or we're focusing on Paul Revere Williams. What about all of the other overlooked um, architects, landscape architect, architects, et cetera. Uh, the committee that uh, subcommittee that developed this within the education committee was uh, Alicia Palaszczuk and Helen Taco. I want to give a shout out to them and their work, and it goes on. Expect more of these programs next year. And I'm particularly pleased that we're talking about landscape architects today because that is such a threatened part of California's uh, culture. Uh, I know in San Luis Obispo, uh, whenever I bring up historical landscapes that managed to have survived, uh, like an American tree planting movement garden that we have here, that they wanted to basically put a lot of tiny houses in the middle of um, our San Luis Cemetery, rural cemetery movement, um, our Jack Garden, which is a garden-esque landscape, which fortunately they recognized when they converted into a park and saved that. But the rarity of these landscapes surviving compared to uh, structures is really um, extraordinary and we need to be so cognizant of how easily they vanish. And so we have two fabulous experts here today that I'm so happy to have recruited. Um, Erin Chase, um, you can read all about her associate curator at the Huntington, but I just want to say quickly, because she might be too shy to say this, how incredibly central a hub the Huntington has become for people not only in our profession, in their research um, archives, their digitized archives, an amazing program, what you can get there. I could not have done my book without the Huntington's digitized archives, but just as a, as a, has transformed itself into a cultural hub of the LA basin. Um, so you have hipsters standing around Lawrence's pinky talking about how much it means to them, which is the last time, the thing that happened to me when I was at the Huntington. Um, so thank you so much for Aaron participating in this and talking about Florence Yawk and their collection of Yawk. And Kelly Comras, um, again, um, so much to say about her, but you must run out and buy. Oh, here it is. This is such a fabulous book. Um, because of its extraordinary detail of how she worked um, on in issues like maintenance and issues like having inexpert workers for her, this is something that um, 
that Kelly is able to talk about as a practicing landscape architect herself, as well as someone deeply involved in the uh, history of landscape architecture. So I'm now going to ask Helen to, or sorry, Kelly uh, Comrus to share her screen so that she can start her PowerPoint. And that will be for 20 minutes. And then, uh, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm making a mess of this. Erin comes first because she's doing Yawk. Kelly comes second. Sorry to panic you, Kelly. So Erin, if you will share your screen and talk about Florence Yawk for us, and then Kelly will come in. And then we will have plenty of time for questions, which you can put in into questions or you can Q&A or you can put them into, um, into the chat. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. And you can hear me. Thank you, James, for that introduction. That was very kind of you. I am i don't recall our paths crossing when you were doing research at the Huntington, but um, I'm so delighted to hear that you got so much out of it. Um, it's what we're here for. So today I'm here to talk about Florence Yock. Um, again, I am Erin Chase, Associate Curator of Architecture and Photography at the Huntington um, in San Marino. And I'm delighted to be speaking with you about Yacht today. I have a particular great fondness for her and an appreciation for her and her partner, Lucille Council, and their remarkable careers as landscape architects in California. Um, and this is in large part because I have the privilege of overseeing Florence Yacht's incredible archive as part of my curatorial responsibilities at the Huntington, which means I've gotten to know her quite well through her various writings and all the wonderful primary sources we have that originated from the busy landscape architecture practice that Yock and Council had for over 50 years. So this presentation will draw almost exclusively from the Huntington's collection. It's one of my absolute favorites uh, to share with people, and whenever I have an opportunity to talk about it, I jump at the chance because I find her life and her work so fascinating. So for this talk, I'm going to focus on what inspired Yock and her work as a landscape designer and a horticulturalist, which I think can be summarized in three important aspects of her life. One is education and a general love of learning, which was deeply rooted in her upbringing. Two was her love of travel and historic architecture, particularly in Western Europe and Mexico. And three, her abiding respect for the site that she was working with and the natural climate and plant species of that location. These themes recur over and over again in her work, which I'll be speaking about in more detail today. I'm also going to add that the collection came in 2015, and I spent a great deal of time with Jim Yock, who uh, Florence was his uh, kind of a distant cousin. He referred to her as an aunt. And um, in consult with him, I learned a great deal about Yock uh, as the papers kind of came in to the Huntington collection. So um, he's, he's a great resource and uh, someone who actually knew her personally. Okay. Uh, okay, so a little background. Florence Yock was born in Santa Ana, California in 1890 to Joseph and Catherine Yock. The youngest of six girls, Yock spent much of her time outdoors, which included horse and buggy trips from the family home in Santa Ana to the beachfront hotel they owned and operated in Laguna Beach. Her parents participated in cultural activities which were influential, influential on Florence and the way she would later see the world. Early in her life, she participated in the salons her parents held in the summer at the Laguna Hotel they owned, and along with that was the life of drama and music that the Polish actress Madame Helena Majeska created at her home in the country, called Arden in Santiago Canyon, where the Yaks were frequent guests. It was there that at Arden that Florence met Majeska's head gardener, Theodore Payne, a California native plant expert. As a young girl, being steeped in the middle of this sort of artistic stimulation deepened her interests in the arts and horticulture, and it was Arden's blend of nature and art that would inspire Yock, who would go on to employ similar idyllic landscapes in her professional work. She was also a voracious reader and became fully absorbed in the popular tomes on gardens at the time, particularly Edith Wharton's Italian Villas and Their Gardens and Gardens for Small Country Houses by Gertrude Jekyll and Lawrence Beaver. So it was in 1910 at the age of 20 that Yacht joined the landscape architecture program at Berkeley. After two years, she found herself at Cornell in the agricultural program there, but then grew restless moving to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she eventually graduated with a degree in landscape architecture in 1915. 
A voracious student, Florence would continue her studies in life, developing a lifelong love of travel and observation. Oops. After graduating from the University of Illinois in 1920, Yock went to work designing smaller traditional gardens in Pasadena and Orange County. She had an apprentice in her office named Catherine Bashford, who trained under her and would later go on to have a highly successful landscape architecture practice of her own, primarily designing gardens in Pasadena. Um, an example of Bashford's work is seen here at the top left of this slide for a 17th century Spanish garden for Roman's bookstore, where Bashford is credited as the artist of the drawing. The, uh, the design is clearly Yock's drawing, um, but Catherine Bashford rendered it. Um, when Bashford left her apprenticeship in 1921, Yock took in a new apprentice named Lucille Council. Lucille had studied the Cambridge School of Domestic and Landscape Architecture in Massachusetts and at Oxford. And it was this partnership between Yock and Council in both business and in life that would endure for over 40 years. Lucille Council became the single most important person in Florence Yock's life, and it is nearly impossible to consider any survey of Yock's work without giving equal credit to her life partner, Lucille. In the mid-1920s, Yock and Council designed the garden for Lucille's parents on Wayne Avenue in South Pasadena, where they also set up their landscape design practice in a studio at the back of the property. They officially went into partnership as a firm in 1925, with Florence acting as the principal designer and Lucille managing the business, including the selecting and ordering of plants and managing the accounting. The two had a crew of extraordinarily skilled people, ranging from office employees to gardeners, masons, and craftspeople. Their standards were high, they were unwavering, and they became infamous for this. After graduating from the University of Illinois in 1920, Yock went to work, oops, Sorry. During her later years, Yock would attribute her recognizable garden designs to the time she and Lucille spent in Europe every year. Throughout her life, she made many, many trips, often for months at a time to France, Italy, Spain, and England. And it was during these excursions she visited both small and large country estates and villages, meticulously sketching what she saw, taking notes about specific architectural elements and paying particular attention to details such as color. This notebook in the middle called Color Notes in Spain is particularly charming and thoughtful as it describes colors in such detail, referencing, for instance, a blanket on a peasant and the blue door of a yellow church. There are four of these notebooks in her archive and on other pages, one will find plant lists, tiny topographical sketches showing design and arrangement, measured details that indicate the close observations she used as she made her way through these landscapes often taking her time, certainly long enough to get the feel of the space throughout the day. Spending time in these remote lo locales with a climate so similar to California's, Yaka was inspired to create similar garden experiences for her clients, whether it be a small garden for a family in Pasadena or a much larger complex estate with no budgetary limits in Beverly Hills. Back at home in California, Yock's approach to new projects showed her preference for being on site and making decisions on the spot. Even when drawings had already been created, there were constant revisions and changes as a result of spontaneous responses to the site. She viewed drawings and plans as a rough guideline that could be changed at any time, and she was also acutely aware of the different types of client demands she might have in Pasadena and Santa Barbara, as opposed to maybe West Los Angeles and later in Monterey. Her commissions in Pasadena at the early part of her career show a range of projects and a strong reputation with important gardening communities and the moneyed clientele of the area. This prompted her to work with several important architects practicing in Southern California during the period, including Myron Hunt, Gordon Kaufman, Reginald Johnson, and Wallace Neff. They trusted and respected her and had full faith that she would bring her structural designs to life, their structural designs to life. One of Yock's first garden commissions in Pasadena was for a pool garden for Mrs. Howard Huntington in 1918, an English country estate home built by architect Myron Hunt, who also designed the Huntington's mansion on the San Marino property. The pool garden shown here reflects Yock's interpretation of a spacious English design scaled down to a more intimate informal garden with its shrug borders and a mix of large and small trees, which help break up the formal geometry of the space. 
And on a very different scale, Yock and her first project working with Lucille Council by her side was commissioned by lumber heiress Mary Stewart to design a series of gardens and outdoor rooms for a complex hillside property in Montecito. Il Berlino, which means the little garden in Italian and couldn't be further from reality when it comes to this site, was planned as a series of formal gardens, including a rose garden, a lemon house, pergolas with paved terraces, sunken gardens, cutting gardens, and an orchard, which serves as a great example of a garden that evolved and changed as it developed. Yacht designed a series of formal and, and informal spaces that would allow the visitor to enjoy varied perspectives and views, often providing an inviting bench or a place to sit, which were always carefully placed to take advantage of what the space had to offer. The design is full of custom pottery, furniture, and other architectural elements that were designed by Yacht and obviously inspired by her Euro European travels. The exceder that crowns the topiary garden was modeled on a similar design seen in Siena, and the fountain below it recalls a water feature at the Villa Medici in Rome. Yacht decided on the large size, size of the exedra after building several test mock-ups that were smaller, but looked insignificant against the mountains in the background. So it wasn't only large garden commissions that appealed to Florence Yock. With her natural inclination towards restraint and economy, designing for smaller homes and creating lower maintenance spaces on small, sometimes oddly shaped lots were challenges she welcomed. She was ahead of the curve in maximizing space using fewer precious resources, a model that would be valuable for California and the rest of the United States in the 1930s and 40s. Early on in her practice, Yock designed this small garden for Mrs. Elizabeth Davenport in Pasadena and it illustrates some of her abiding principles for good design, which she became known for. The design included an architectural element as the focus, although slightly off-center, as seen in the fountain here, complex walks to create unexpected roots through the garden, a formal parterre, mixed plantings and flowers, a flowering fruit tree, scattered pots and ambling vines. This particular garden earned Yacht recognition in Rex Newcomb's 1927 book, The Spanish House for America, where he credits her as the landscape architect for this project, the only such credit for landscape architecture in the book's 200 illustrations. Florence Yock also completed a large number of public gardens during her tenure. She designed the landscapes for the Romans Bookstore Courtyard, which I shared earlier, the Women's Athletic Club downtown uh, in downtown LA designed by architects Allison and Allison in 1925 the Pasadena Public Library, the Wilshire Country Club, and numerous others. One of her most successful public gardens was for the campus expansion of the California Institute of Technology in the early 1930s. The buildings were designed by architect Gordon Kaufman in an Italianate style, and he asked Yakin Council to create plans for the gardens and the public pathways to integrate the buildings and soften the structures. The first phase included landscaping the Athenaeum Faculty Club and Courtyard. Yock and Council carefully selected mature olive trees for the entry court, complete with twisted trunks give, to give the illusion that they'd always been there. To further support the Italian style, they included a collection of Mediterranean plants, including cypresses, palms, pyracantha, crepe myrtle, and cup of gold vine, which would meander around the building. A simple sycamore allay occupies the space between the north facade and the tennis courts. The Caltep the Caltech job was perhaps one of the most extravagant and lucrative jobs ever for Yakin Council. Florence Yock's commissions in the 1920s and into the 1930s also included work for clients in West Los Angeles, many of them movie producers and directors. Among them were Dorothy Arzner, David O. Selznick, George Cukor, and Jack Warner. Yock noticed a distinct difference between the demands of movie moguls and her tr traditional Pasadena clients, especially when it came to garden design. With the burgeoning film industry taking off during the Great Depression, money was flowing, and unsurprisingly, those who profited wanted to enjoy it. Very often, the lots of these homes were on some sort of a slope, which presented opportunities to make her gardens more theatrical, spacious, and expensive. The commissions in West Los Angeles were lavish, and they required building on raw, treeless sites where everything had to be brought in. Dorothy Arzner, one of the first female directors of her generation, hired Yock to build on her steep hillside lot, um, a massive structure that required vast excavation and walls, 
uh, which she used to create a series of terraces. The photograph in the middle shows the construction of the Arsner site with wooden mock-ups for the possible heights of these ginormous walls. Yak moved and relocated many large trees, including oaks, orange, cypress, Monterey pines, and English laurel. The photograph on the right shows the finished garden with vines and flowers cascading over a steep stairway leading to the pergola. And I believe that stairway is something like 75 steps. It goes very high. So pleased was Arsner with Yock's work that she recommended to her to other influential Hollywood people of the time. Soon, Yock was working for Mr. and Mrs. Jack Warner on their massive nine-acre neoclassical estate, which included a home by Roland Coat, architect, and interiors by Billy Haynes. Yock also designed the homes of directors George Cukor and David O. Selznick. For George Cukor, Yock designed a much more scaled-back, intimate garden which was relaxed and unpretentious and served as a welcoming space for the numerous gatherings he hosted for his Hollywood friends. The architect, James Delina, pushed the residents into the hillside, allowing Yacht to use the primary portion of the property for a fruit orchard and rose garden on the west end, and a long ramped walk up to the pool on the north end, which served as an access point between the residents and the rest of the property. The walk past the pool meandered through spring flower borders that Kukor reportedly spent $1,000 a year replacing to keep the plantings lush and profuse. He evidently relied on his gardener to replace these annuals, uh, and he, uh, I guess, eventually received numerous criticisms, <laughs> notes of criticism from Yak over the years for planting the wrong type of flowers year after year she implored him to change them out. Yock's reputation for literally moving mountains and creating romantic, sometimes flamboyant gardens for movie moguls was so impressive that in the late 1930s, she found herself designing their film sets. Her reputation for simplicity and economy was a draw to those managing large bud budgets, and there was a full faith that if anyone could create a historic garden, it would be her. The film sets she designed were used in some of the most popular movies of the day, including The Garden of Allah and Romeo and Juliet in 1936. The Good Earth in 1937, Gone with the Wind in 1939, and How Green Was My Valley in 1941. For The Garden of Allah, producer David O. Selznick knew that the scenery had to be authentic and perfect, so hiring a landscape architect who specialized in traditional Mediterranean forms would be necessary, and there was only one person for the job, in his opinion, and that was Florence Yock. In making the argument for the budget line that would support this, Selznick is quoted as saying, one of the most important things in the picture is the garden itself. In my opinion, work on the planting of this should be started at once. I would urge we engage Florence Yock for the job, even though she would cost us a good deal of extra money. The landscaping must be simply magnificent as so much of the story depends upon the beauty of this garden. Indeed, Selznick sent Yock to North Africa in May of 1935 to research the desert and oasis locations. During her time there, she took photographs of everything, the architecture, the clothing, the customs, and she made sketches. The one shown here is at the Villa Landon, where she notes on the left side, palms, etc., on this blank wall, and bougainvillea on the right. Note also the description of color again for the house, which she describes as creamy white, richly stained, with shutters that are dead white. Working again for Selznick, Yock also designed the sets for one of the most popular movies of all time, Gone with the Wind. The story, having been written by Margaret Mitchell in 1936, was one of the most beloved works of popular historical fiction in America at the time. For the film, Selznick wanted to put the emphasis on Tara, the plantation of the main character, Scarlett O'Hara. To make this happen, Selznick was willing to spend generous amounts of money on the set construction. The estimate for set construction in October of 1938 shows the emphasis on Yock's work with the budget allowing $16,000 to landscape the drive, garden, gates, and veranda of Terra. Yacht traveled to Georgia to research plant and, tip and typical plantations to gather design ideas. Back on the MGM lot, she superintended the planting of large trees that had been moved along with their roots on trucks. She added real magnolia trees and substituted other real trees with similar, with similar lines for dogwood. The property department also fabricated hundreds of replica greenery, which was tied onto real greenery to create the lush look of the plantation. 
The final product, product was a visually iconic set that came to life through its meticulous landscaping. As is well known, the film, having been in, released at the close of the Great Depression, was an escape for viewers and was a financial success, becoming one of the highest grossing movies of all time. So to close this talk out, I wanted to share a few pages from the archive that illustrate the knowledge and breadth Florence Yock and Lucille Council had over their craft. From 1915 continu continuing until 1971, the two completed more than 250 jobs. I've only covered a very small portion of their work and it doesn't begin to speak to their lengthy and storied careers. In Florence Yock's archive at the Huntington, one will find numerous notebooks containing special instructions for all aspects of gardening, garden care and design, um, new, uh, including those directions for composting materials that Florence had perfected over time, which you can see here on the slide. Um, and also a recipe for a concrete, concrete color formula for an enormous job for BF Johnston in Los Mochis, Mexico. The collection is full of instructions like this. Florence had planned to write a book that would include all of it, but that never happened. For their clients, Yock and Council would provide a complete booklet of typed instructions that would specify in great detail how to care for their garden for years to come. In it would be plant lists, schedules for changing out annuals, specific arrangement of plants and planting and watering instructions over the four seasons. The two never needed to solicit work. All of their clients came to them via word of mouth and they accepted commissions knowing that their relationships with them would be ongoing. Designing for small and large properties with site-specific design, native planting, and motivated by providing the most pleasant experience for the visitor was always the goal. And the personal supervision they gave each job, along with their exacting standards in workmanship, have ensured an enduring legacy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. I am just going to pop in here to say that we will save all questions for the end, whether it's raised hands, John Tillotson, or Wendy Osaki uh, questions in the chat or anybody else. And now I am going to ask Kelly Comras to share her screen. And let's see if the technology works. I'm confident. Oh, and Kelly, if you could unmute. Just, just yes. saw, sorry about that. Um, okay, is that showing properly? We don't see your screen as yet. You don't see it? No. A minute. Sorry about that. How is that? Still not, oh. Yes, now it is sharing. Great. Uh, all right. So it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks for walking me through that, James. And um, thank you, Aaron, for that really wonderful lecture. I, I read the uh, book on J that James Yock had written years ago, but uh, he really added so much depth to it, and I appreciate that. Um, just so people know, some of you in the audience may not be familiar with the connection between Florence Yock and Ruth Shellhorn. Uh, they were, after all, um, of two consecutive generations in both age and in the breadth of their design practices. But today's lecture is pairing Ruth Shellhorn with Florence Yock because Yock became a kind of mentor to Shellhorn when she was 15 years old. And later, Yock gave her uh, Shellhorn professional advice that significantly influenced Shellhorn's practice as she developed as a landscape architect. Shellhorn would go on, um, I'm sorry, but I'm on the wrong um, slide there. Sorry about that. Shellhorn would go on to become one of the mid-century era's most versatile landscape architects. Between 1933 and 1990, she created close to 400 landscape designs, representing a wide range of project types. Her work included award-winning landscape designs for the Bullock's department stores and Fashion Square shopping centers, like this Fashion Square Santa Ana entry court we see here, which was photographed about a decade after it was designed by Shellhorn in 1958. 
Shellhorn also collaborated with Walt Disney on the original site and landscape plan for Disneyland in 1955. She became the supervising landscape architect who oversaw a multi-year landscape master plan for the University of California at Riverside during the late 1950s and early 1960s. And she designed, she designed a master coastal planning project along the Los Angeles County coastline in 1944. She also created numerous city and regional park designs, beginning with a Ralph Cornell collaboration on the Verdugo Park site plan, and designed more than 200 residential estates and gardens throughout Southern California. Ruth Patricia Shellhorn was born in Pasadena on September 21st, 1909, and grew up immersed in the California landscape. She was fortunate in her parents, two college graduates, who encouraged her to pursue a profession that made use of her strong math skills and artistic ability, and in her neighbor, Florence Yock, who inspired Shellhorn to pursue a career in landscape architecture. Yock became a mentor to young Ruth, who left home in 1927 to become a landscape architect herself. Shellhorn studied for six years, first at Oregon State College, then at Cornell University, where she took courses in design, engineering, regional planning, and horticulture. When she came back to California to begin a practice in 1933, during the depths of the Great Depression, work was scarce, even for established landscape architects, Though, as Aaron has pointed out, Florence Yacht did not seem to be uh, suffering nearly as much because of all the industry contacts and work. Still, Yacht could give Shellhorn only a few brief drafting assignments, but she also offered encouragement and priceless advice, counseling Shellhorn to one, pay meticulous attention to the details of design, two, focus on the craftsmanship of construction, three, exert absolute control over a project whenever possible, and four, insist on long-term maintenance contracts in order to extend the initial integrity of the landscapes. Over time, these imperatives became trademarks of Shellhorn's own practice. Oops. During the course of her nearly 60-year career, Shellhorn collaborated with some of the most celebrated architects and architectural firms in the region, including Welton Beckett, Ferreira and Luckman, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, Killingsworth, Brady and Associates, A. Quincy Jones and Wallace Neff. It was her design work with Welton Beckett, however, that exerted an especially significant influence on the Southern California landscape during the post-war era. Their collaboration included development of Bullock's department stores, Bullock's Fashion Square shopping centers, and a number of other award-winning retail and commercial projects throughout the region. Bullock's Pasadena was hailed as a bellwether project when it opened in 1947. The first modern department store in the region to be located in the suburbs, and one of the first of a genre to explicitly embrace the automobile. Everything about this new Bullock spoke to a fresh, innovative style of California living. The project architect, Walton Beckett, designed the department store to emphasize open space, horizontality, convenience, and Southern California's indoor-outdoor living ethos. Shellhorn's landscape design echoed Beckett's architectural approach. She interpreted the development as a park-like oasis within a larger suburban landscape, introducing a cool modern palette of tropical themed plants with complementary bold forms. It was necessary to select plants that could adapt to the hot dry summers and cold wet winters of the, the interior valley climate of Pasadena. But within those restrictions, she chose large leafed glossy plants to give a rich texture and she opted for a relatively limited plant palette in keeping with the size and simplicity of the store. These were lush exotic settings that emphasized park-like qualities 
and redefined the suburban shopping experience as a leisurely recreational activity. Clients, critics, and practitioners praised the design for capturing the essence of California's sun soap lifestyle, which they variously described as the California scene, the spirit of California, and the Southern California look. Together, Beckett and Shellhorn's visual style expressed a modern spirit that caught the optimism of the times. Heeding Florence Yock's advice, Shellhorn gave special attention to the details of pedestrian movement, such as the transition from street to store entrance. Each turn of direction or set of steps presented an opportunity to compose a scene, not just a planter filled with plants, but a picture composed like a classical painting, balanced with a hierarchical arrangement of elements and a discernible foreground, middle ground, and background. This was one form of the Southern California look, a modern expression of traditional principles. This expression applied to other elements from the formal tradition as well. When working with a small amount of planting space, for example, she experimented with espaliers, introducing a modern informality that took a the form of an abstract sculpture. Here, Beckett had specified bronze hardware for the store. Shellhorn introduced the highly polished bronze tinted underleaves of a twining kangaroo vine to adorn this alcove. It added a shimmering detail of elegance as one pulled open the adjacent door. In 1957, Beckett added a parking structure for 1,800 cars to replace the south parking lot. And under Shellhorn's direction, the tight area between parking garage and store became a beautiful garden courtyard of enclosed space. She selected paving to create a pleasing movement and added curbing for a detail of definition. Her textured compositions of bold leaves contrasted with linear strap leaf foliage. The soothing neutral tones of Beckett's stone walls blended seamlessly with the site furniture, including a seat to search for one's keys, which provided a thoughtful touch of liv livability. The Bullock's projects were a good example of Shellhorn's adoption of Yawk's imperatives. With this first Bullock's department store, you can see how Shellhorn focused meticulous attention on the details of design and the craftsmanship of construction. Shellhorn created not only a design template for subsequent Bullock stores, she hired her own construction crews in order to exert absolute control over the project. And she insisted on long-term maintenance contracts to extend the initial integrity of the landscapes. She was a good student. As time went on, the value of such arrangements became more obvious, even as the ability to establish those contracts began to wane. Of Yacht's influence on Shellhorn, landscape historian David Stretfield wrote, maintenance was a critical element in Shellhorn's design approach. She learned from Florence Yacht the importance of superb and regular maintenance and the preparation of detailed maintenance reports. Thus in Shellhorn's work, the world of the immaculately maintained private garden was transferred into the public world of the shopping center, faultless supervision and maintenance. She insisted on contracts with, where she could return every year to check on the maintenance practices. This alone distinguished her work from that of other modernists. The extent of Yock's imperatives was present in what is arguably Shellhorn's most famous project. Her Bullock's landscapes had established verdant sanctuaries where generous walkways, framed views, and hidden alcoves shaped the experience of the shopper. Her skill at creating these imaginative settings in the midst of everyday life caught the attention of another kind of developer in Southern California. That developer was Walt Disney, and he needed a landscape architect who could help him tie together the very different attractions of Fantasyland, Frontierland, Adventureland, and Tomorrowland. He called Shellhorn in March of 1955 he planned to open the park just four months later on July 17th. As with Bullock's, Shellhorn set out to shape the visitor's experience, this time creating a pedestrian plan inspired by the make-believe nature of the park itself. 
She designed islands of flowers and foliage that mirrored the park's exotic and whimsical themes. She narrowed the walkways to create a feeling of suspense at some points, helped dramatize the park's centerpiece, Sleeping Beauty Castle, and she collaborated with a design team to tie the many parts of Disneyland together by placing full-grown trees of the same species in different locations throughout the park. As with this silhouette of a Melaleuca tree, which Shellhorn placed in front of the castle to evoke the presence of Sleeping Beauty's evil queen, Shellhorn was evolving the tenets of Yawk's imperatives, one of which came to be, use the right plant for the right place. In 1928, just a year after Ruth Shellhorn left home for college, Florence Yock undertook the design of a garden that would come full circle regarding the friendship between these two women. Designed for oil man Ira Briner, the garden was part of a property that spread across three lots and sloped steeply down to the street. The architect, Roland Cote, positioned the residence with views of the San Gabriel Mountains to the north and the nearby Arroyo to the west. The garden was actually three gardens, each reflecting inspiration from a different European precedent. On the terrace closest to the house was a small citrus grove of orange, lime, and tangerine trees reminiscent of simple Spanish gardens. The second terrace displayed roses in a formal elongated oval, a reference to French gardens. And the bottom terrace presented a broad panel of lawn, alluding to English garden traditions. 11 flights of stairs connected the terraces, referring to the water parterre at the Via Gambaria in Florence. Yacht's period revival garden was considered an elegant, concise adaptation of European prototypes that juxtaposed traditional design elements with natural features. In 1941, Albert and Harriet Doerr purchased the property and hired Yacht to return and simplify the garden in a response to the wartime decrease in staff. During this period, Yacht was particularly concerned with designing low maintenance gardens, a passion Shellhorn would come to share. Both Florence Yacht and Albert Doerr died in 1972. Six years later, Harriet consulted Shellhorn about the possibility of either selling off the garden portion of the property or altering it to make it easier to manage. Shellhorn advised preserving the garden. Oops, sorry. Here, Shellhorn endeavored to respect Yock's original design and show regard for Yock's concern with designing low maintenance gardens while preserving the garden's original structure. In 1988, Shellhorn replied to inquiries from Yock's biographer. She wrote, Florence was one of a kind. The fact that so many of her gardens are being lovingly cared for to preserve her designs is a real tribute. I had lunch with Harriet Dorr last Tuesday and I went over the garden with her making suggestions. I have tried in my recommendations to preserve the spirit of the garden Florence created. Shellhorn maintained the garden's original structure, preparing no formal plans, but visiting the garden several times a year to supervise landscape repairs and address small changes. Her files reveal careful research and experimentation with newly available plants, as well as a capacity to adapt to new materials when formerly available brick, stone, and gravel sources disappeared. Shellhorn restrained herself from making an imprint on this garden, and in doing so, she not only preserved it, but maintained the intent of the original design. The small sh changes Shellhorn did make helped to lend cohesion to the garden. During the late 1970s, she substituted high maintenance perennials surrounding the lawn and rose garden with bushy, frequently blooming fielders white and Alaska azaleas. These sun tolerant hybrids proved a judicious choice when an attack of oak root fungus began to claim the garden's major shade providers. As the oak trees succumbed, they were supplanted with deciduous trees resistant to the fungus. 
such as jacaranda, liquid ambar, and evergreen pear. Chinese holly replaced the viburnum hedges, and orange jessamine replaced toyon. Shellhorn managed to retain Yawk's subtle textural effects, and the white line of azaleas strengthened the axial relationship between the pond and the garden house. As the years passed, Shellhorn's continued maintenance of the garden led to additional adaptations and alterations. In preparation for a garden club tour in the spring of 1980, she found herself searching for rock cinder mulch to match the existing gravel around the Rose Island, which had been placed 50 years earlier. Transcendent and Florabunda crab apples were planted in the upper ter terrace and the Dicondra lawn was reseeded and then later replaced with turf. In the late 1980s, when neighbors installed a swimming pool, Shellhorn planted a bank of puka, a screening shrub with, a shrub with dark tree leaves. In 1996, almost 20 years after Shellhorn began her work, Harriet Dorr wrote a wistful essay about her love for this garden in Architectural Digest. She sent a copy to Shellhorn with an affectionate note of thanks for recommending the preservation of the garden. Shellhorn's loving care of the garden was a fitting tribute from a student who owed much of her success to the inspiration of her mentor. She took pride in carrying out Yach's lessons, preserving a legacy that is now shared. Thank you everyone for giving me the opportunity to talk about these two excellent landscape architects. Okay, applause to both of our speakers. Um, it's just overwhelming to me, not only the these pioneering landscape architects who helped create the California landscape that the rest of the world dreams about, um, but also that uh, Kelly and Aaron um, have these two so important positions as curators and writers of this history because if we don't if we don't talk about them they disappear landscapes are so fragile and they are so in demand people look at them and say oh well this isn't being used <laughs> there's no building here and uh, and unless we have the language to talk about them and the desire to talk about them uh they are horribly threatened, uh, much more than than even our built landscape. So thank you so much to both of our speakers. And let's jump into, no, I just want to mention uh, the Huntington Gardens as being a terribly important uh, living history of the California landscape and the types of plants that were used and imported. So uh, if I had Aaron's job, I would never be in that office. I would be sitting out in the garden all day long. Uh, staring into space. I want to mention the Ken Burns film on uh, Ruth Shellhorn that Kelly did, and you can find that on YouTube, just as our previous um, installments in this series on women women who changed architecture and Ed Lemure. And um, James, I just want to interject for one minute. This um, the, the, the Library of American Landscape History is the one that put the film together. And it was a partner of Ken Burns's named um, um, Lawrence that um, directed the film. But yes, it's on it's online on YouTube. But it is nonetheless very Burnsian. <laughs> it's very Burnsian. You are so right. It has that quality. Uh, it has that smoothness. And it's so nice to be able to push Yawk and Shellhorn today because as Shellhorn, as you reveal in your book, Shellhorn, you know, said, oh, if only I would, you know, could push myself the way Ekbo pushes himself. You know, they didn't like Morgan. They were not pushing themselves. And of course, in in um, uh, Hearst Castle, the guides used to say, oh, this was designed by a woman. We don't know anything about her, <laughs> you know, until, until Sarah Holmes Boutel did her work. So um, we have a raised hand from John Tillotson, and is there a way to, can Lisa, you uh, allow John to speak? There he is. Uh, can you unmute yourself, John? I see John still muted. Hmm. 
So either we are muting him or he is muting himself. Well, let me go on to, um, until I see that, him unmuted. Wendy Osaki's question, did anyone take over their practice? So uh, both of them? You mean Yak or Shellhorn or both? Uh, either, either or both. So uh, I can speak about Florence Yak. Yeah, nobody took over her practice. However, again, she, um, her much younger cousin, James Yak, who was an English professor at the University of Oklahoma, um, studied her so intently and then uh, developed his own architecture practice, landscape architecture practice, and worked on many existing Florence Yak designs to restore them. And he was loved by his clients. He passed away five years ago. Um, and then he also developed his own big clientele uh, independently of Florence Yak's work, but working very much in the same manner that she did. So um, yeah, nobody, but he's passed away. So there, there's no surviving practice now. Um, I would add also uh, with respect to the Pasadena work, um, when Florence Yak moved up north, she started to pass on some of her clients in Pasadena to Ruth Shellhorn. And um, mm. the um, uh, work that Shellhorn did on the door garden was because Florence Yak had recommended her. Yeah, the importance of mentorship has come out so much with the women architects uh, who were able to you know, break through the glass ceiling and practice. Um, there's a somewhat related question from Thomas E. Um, of both presentations, how many of the designs by Yock and Shellhorn are still in existence? Oh, that's so hard with landscapes. <laughs> you know, it's not a, a, a structure, so uh, it depends on how it was maintained, of course. Um, I can say that we know, if you're from Pasadena, that the Bromans Bookstore Courtyard was demolished a long time ago. Um, but there are gardens that exist, uh, especially those that had mature trees that still have them, like the Caltech campus. I know Il Brolino is very much intact. Um, the, the Council Garden on Wayne Avenue in South Pasadena, I believe, is fairly intact. Um, but, you know, I don't think any of them are going to be perfectly the same, um, sadly. Yeah. I think um, in, in an odd twist of fate, Disneyland is probably the best preserved large scale project that Ruth did. And although it's changed tremendously, if you go to Disneyland to the original core area and walk around with somebody who knows, lots and lots of, of what's there was, was her under her direction. But of course, you know, the trees have been replanted over the years. They're in second and third and fourth generations. There are a lot of um, gardens in Pasadena that um, were identified in the um, multiple prop multiple property uh, historic survey um, that Sappos did about 10 years ago. And, and it lists at that time which gardens were intact and to what extent they were. And a lot of them have photographs. I, you can get that information from the city of Pasadena. Um, here's a specific question about has the Pasadena Bullocks survived? It um, it got transferred uh, through multiple hands. It was a uh, Federated for a while. It was a Macy's for a while. Um, and I think Macy's may still own it, although I understand Macy's has sold out now. And so it's in flux. The gardens themselves around the, the building close in aren't really intact. The trees all around the um, perimeter along the sidewalk and, and farther towards the parking area, many of those are intact, but it doesn't have the feeling. You would not put on a dress and wear white gloves to go shopping there today. I Interestingly, I have a distinct memory of the last <laughs> time I saw someone wearing a dress and white gloves. <laughs> it was at Buffum's department store in San Diego in the 1970s. And I said, yeah. I will never see this again. <laughs> so yeah. um, we have a question about the garden at the Pasadena Unitarian Church. Is that the one mentioned in the slide from Florence Yark? Yark? I, I saw that one. I'm not sure. Are they? I don't know if they're asking about the neighborhood church. Um, it's highly possible. Um, one thing I could say in promoting Jim Yock's book, Landscaping the American Dream, which I know you linked out to, is there's a client list, and those are really important, and they shed a lot of light on, uh, you know, on her practice. So um, it might be listed in there, and also. Um, at some point, I'd like to link out maybe post post webinar, 
to the Huntington's collection because the Huntington's collection came directly from Yawk Studio and many, many, uh, she kept files on many, many of these pro projects. Uh, it's a very big collection. So there could be information on the Unitarian Church there. Now, we have had a um, very vigorous discussion about Disneyland <laughs> as, as fitting to California. And um, um, and I think the, the thing people have been talking about, the changes people have been talking about, the, the incredible functionality, the centrality of that landscape, um, certainly I remember going up, growing up, I have images of those landscapes as a child being taken there, but um, questions about preservation of that. And if that, um, sadly, it's probably not under the um, federal government because it is its own separate land, but, um, or, you know, is, it, has there been any effort to um, landmark um is there any effort by Disneyland to save itself? Uh, save its, um, th there's mentioned that a lot of new big tech rides have um, impinged upon that landscape. Yeah, I, I think the point about it being a private entity, um, you know, is a good one, James. For years and years, the work that Ruth Shellhorn did was pretty much revered by the Imagineers. Um, when Ruth was still alive, she um, was invited to go to Disneyland and meet with the Imagineers so that they could, you know, they said they wanted to pick her brain and they had so many questions. Um, I took her out there, we spent a whole day and she, uh, you know, spoke with them about what her intent had been. And there had been a really um, strong effort at the time to preserve that, that sort of oral history for themselves. But as time has gone on, you know, the, the management of Disneyland has changed and, you know, streaming came in. There's just a very much different um, emphasis. Uh, so I don't know as of today, you know, the, the 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 layout of Disneyland, what she did, much of that is still intact. And, and the intent to go ahead and try and create these, these pockets of imaginative background. You know, she worked with Bill Evans and he always said, you know, the plants tell the story, the plants tell the story. So if you wanted, um, you know, an area near the, the uh, Sleeping Beauty Castle, then those brambly, you know, uh, thinly cut Melaleuca were going to tell that story. If you were in Jungle Cruise, you were looking at, you know, philodendron and big glossy green leaves. And so I think that is still intact. And that's what Disney does. That's that's their their forte. There is, um, I will throw it out there, and I can't remember the name of the film, but it's one of the, I think it's the only, maybe the only amateur film archived by the Library of Congress, the most important films in America, or some such entity. It's an early film of a visit to Disneyland. Someone won a contest who lived in New Jersey, I think, and yes. it's from the 1950s, and the family goes out to Disneyland, and they record the experience, and they they stay at the Langham in um, Pasadena and it's on YouTube in its entirety. I think it's about half an hour, 20 minutes to half an hour long. And because there's discussion in the chat uh, about how to access early images and film of Disneyland. And if you can find that, I wish I had in my brain the uh, name of the film and the creator of the film, but it's on YouTube and my attempts to skate around a description may actually pull it up. Uh, John Haber may be able to do it. He is apparently known as Uncle Google. So um, one last question in here is um, about sustainability, about drought. And clearly um, there was a good deal of emphasis on the native California landscape and also about sustainability of maintenance. But can you, uh, either of you or both of you shed some light of the sustainability of these gardens in the context of our current drought situation and foreseeable drought situation. Oh, I'll let Kelly answer that since she's actively in the field doing this work. <laughs> uh, I, I would say that, you know, uh, early on, it was clear to Ruth, especially by the time she was working at the University of California at Riverside, when she developed the master plan there, starting in 1956, that it's a massively large campus. And even then, when we were pumping 
the groundwater out as fast as we could. It was clear to her that she, there, there was no way that they were going to be able to put together, you know, a lush garden there. So she has pockets all over the campus that were, you know, cactus gardens or, you know, dry fern gardens, all that sort of thing. I think also, in, you know, as a companion to um, native plants, as she really looked at sustainability, the university had planned to fill in those arroyos and um, use them for parking areas because they'd be sitting on fill. And she just lobbied for years to keep them from doing that. And so when you go to the campus now, it's wonderful because these arroyos still cut through the campus. She called them rivers of green. And there are little bridges over them and there are paths that go down and meander through them. And it gives the campus a really unique character within the whole string of campuses throughout California that I think is pretty special. Yeah, and the UCs are taking their historic preservation uh, very um, importantly, as uh, we found out in, in other programs. Um, I would like to wrap up by, again, just giving my gratitude to these two speakers, not only for their presentations today, but for their involvement in saving these landscapes by talking about these landscapes and keeping the records of these landscapes and access to these landscapes. So do you do buy Kelly's fabulous book, um, lavishly illustrated, just amazing book. Um, do go to the Huntington, uh, go as a researcher, um, but also go as a visitor. Um, and it's just an extraordinary experience and so central to Los Angeles, as opposed to the sleepy um, institution of my childhood that opened at 1, 1 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For three so hours. We, we all go on a bus <laughs> and have lunch in Lacey Park waiting for it to open. Um, and do support the California Preservation Foundation. This is a free program. This will go out free on YouTube afterwards. So look for it and rewatch it. But of course, that costs money. So um, Lisa and John, we have to pay them. And um, so please, please join. And once you've joined, volunteer to create programs like this on the Education Committee. Uh, that's it from me signing off from the um, History Center of San Luis Obispo County in our historic Carnegie Library. And over to you, Lisa. Thank you, James. I could not have said the closing better myself. Uh, I just wanted to say that we dropped a survey into the chat box uh, to give us feedback on today's program and to suggest future topics that you'd like to see uh, from us. Uh, you'll also be redirected to the same link upon closing your Zoom window. I uh, also wanted to mention our upcoming programming. We've got a three-part holiday series entitled Ink Three Could Be Merry uh, that will start on Tuesday, or excuse me, Tuesday, November 28th uh, and run for the following three weeks. Uh, you can find information about that on calfairpreservation.org. And while you're there, as James mentioned, we would love to have you uh, either join us as a member or appreciate uh, all support that you're able to provide to us and our ability to continue to provide these programs to you uh, free of charge. Uh, thank you, James. Thank you, Aaron and Kelly. Uh, it's been an amazing program. Uh, I hope everyone has a great afternoon and that we will see you all soon.